All right, welcome to the Stanford Energy Seminar. My name is Will Chu. It's my great pleasure to introduce our very special speaker today, Karen Skelton. We are very delighted at the Door School to welcome her as a visiting scholar in the Precorp Institute for Energy, where she will be spending her precious time here to interact with all of you on everything and anything related to energy and sustainability. Looking at the title of her talk, America's Energy Transition, this really captures the essence of her work. Having spent 35 years across many levels of government, advising, influencing, and executing policy of the nation and also internationally as well. She advised presidents, vice presidents, cabinet secretaries, governors, first ladies, Fortune 100 companies, philanthropies, board of directors, and now Stanford professors and students. She had an illustrious career in government service. I'll just note a few. Um, she served in the Clinton administration as Al Gore's first political director. She also served in the Department of Justice and also in the Federal Highway Administration. Most recently, she served as the senior policy advisor to the Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, and also uh, John Podesta, the nation's top climate diplomat. She's played many roles, as I mentioned, and today we're very lucky to have Karen talk about the transition, how the Inflation Reduction Act was conceived, some of the challenges and interesting stories behind the scenes. So without further ado, let us welcome Karen to the presentation. Am I on? Yes. I am so happy to be here. I've done all those things, but I've never spoken to so many smart people who know a lot about energy. So you'll have to forgive me if I don't uh, step up to the plate. Um, I want to thank a couple people, first of all. Coming to the Door School is a kind of a, a full circle for me because one of my mentors in life is John Doerr. And so I want to thank John and Ann Doerr for their generosity um, in, in bringing a place like this possible making a place like this possible where we can talk. And I want to thank Arun Majumdar for all he's done and the work he's done for Secretary Granholm in the Department of Energy and for our country. Uh, I also want to thank you, Will, for uh, taking me under your wing and for uh, John and Rachel and, uh, and my friend Kate and, uh, and Holmes Hummel, who is my partner in crime, I think, now. So anyway, with all those thank yous, um, you guys probably have heard some of what I'm going to say, so I, I, maybe you haven't heard it today, so it'll be fresh today. Um, I'm going to talk for just a little bit, about 10 minutes, and just give you an overview of how I'm thinking about the energy transition and what the government's been working on and what this little election in 30 days or so has to do with all of that. And then I'm really looking forward to taking your questions. So let's start with why are we even here? So we are here because the country now has, the world now has the largest, and I would say the most important and influential climate and energy laws in the history of the world. And this is a very exciting thing, right? This is uh, trillions of dollars have been invested in the United States. This is private sector investments in semiconductors and clean energy manufacturing, batteries and EVs, bio manufacturing, heavy industry, clean power, and another, oh, about a trillion dollars in public investments. And this has all happened really in the last two years. August 16, 2022 is when the Inflation Reduction Act was passed. And that, along with the CHIPS Act and the bipartisan infrastructure law, we have a suite of um, pieces of legislation that are really changing everything when it comes to energy. Also, in addition to uh, these investments, we have 600 uh, manufacturing companies have made commitments to build clean energy manufacturing plants all over the country. There have been some um, 800,000 jobs created since uh, the, the Biden uh, administration. And I always think of my friend Kate Gordon sitting here. Those jobs are mostly in construction, but many of them will be permanent jobs over time. So this is a big deal, it's massive, and it's here. 
The transition is happening. It's happening right now as we sit here in places like Muskegee, Michigan, to Weirton, West Virginia, to Moses Lake, Washington, to Dalton, Georgia, all over the country it's happening. It's mesmerizing. It's happening here and it's happening everywhere. And it's happening, um, and it's happening in, in large part because of the innovation driven by many of you, whether you're uh, writing about it, whether you're researching, you're studying, you're studying things that are really gonna matter in the market going forward. Here are the technologies that are primarily supported by the new uh, energy climate laws. I bet 90% of you are working in one of these areas, doing some research or um, uh, writing about it, working on it, starting companies that work on it. It's happening in a nonpartisan way as well. So it's happening all over the country. Primarily, vast amounts of this money has gone to red districts and states. So you can see $200 billion in clean tech manufacturing investments in these red areas are red congressional districts. So 161 billion compared to 42 billion. And it's happening in places where you don't need a college education to get a job. It's happening, you can see this blue um, spike is post IRA, post August, 2022, where these jobs are starting to be in low income or places where college educations are not required. So these are some great things. I think you will uh, admit like this is, this, is, this is one of the most important times to be alive if you're into energy. I mean, only three of these major transitions have happened in energy over the last 200 years, right? I mean, we went from burning wood and dung to a coal-driven energy economy to uh, petroleum and natural gas economy to fuel the auto age. And now we're at another pivot point and it's happening, it's all great, but it is not without huge vulnerabilities. So one of the, I'll talk about a couple of them and then I'll talk about the election. But one of the big vulnerabilities is that this is so much money so quickly that the capacity to metabolize it in an organization is very hard to do. So we have to make sure that organizations that receive the funding actually can ha handle it. Hire accountants and lawyers and know how to, um, to grow a business and to patent things. And so that's a big challenge. Another challenge is to communicate what we're doing. So many people don't know what any of, of this money is going for. So there's a challenge of talking about how these investments are actually affecting real people, real families. In the government, we call that lower costs and higher quality. Or we, we talk about security, the security to this nation that the energy, new energy economy brings because we don't have to rely on other nations. We talk about the scale, bringing down the costs. These are the kinds of things that we talk about with families. But you know, things really only stick when they're emotionally tied to you. And so this is a real challenge for the IRA because we, I call it the IRAs. It's really funny to me that these laws are called IRA, Bill, and Ships, which are all guys' names. So I don't know. I, I just call it the climate plan now. Um, so that's a big challenge. But the biggest challenge probably is the presidential election and what's going to happen in Congress um, in the next 30 days or so. And I'll just go through this quickly. Believe me, I'm a hack. So if you want to sit down and talk about the politics of any of this afterwards, I'm happy to talk to you about it. But you know, as well as I know, anybody alive not under a rock right now knows this is a very, very close election. And um, I'm showing you this graph here because it just shows that on October 1st, that was yesterday, this is where we're at. I think we're closer to that in, the, in, in many of the states, you know, there are seven states that really matter. Some days it's six or seven. We're up and down in those. This is just meant to tell you, of course, the electoral map will matter more than the popular vote, as it has in the last few presidential elections, including with my boss in the day, Al Gore. Um, but it's super, super close. 
And in the congressional races, also super, super close. I mean, as you know, right now in the Senate, 51 Democrats, 49 Republicans, two of those uh, Democrats are independents that just caucus with the Democrats. So we're very much in a um, precarious situation in the Senate. There are seven uh, targeted Senate races that are the most important ones to determine the ballots of the Senate. And in the House, it couldn't be closer. I mean, most consensus right now says that there are only really 21 House seats that are up for grabs. And that if you just looked at the solids and the leans and the Republican and Democratic parties, you're going to be tied. So this is could, could not be closer. So who cares? Like, what does it matter to you at Stanford uh, who are studying energy? How, how does this matter? Well, it matters in some uh, big ways and some small ways. In the biggest way, it matters because the candidates are philosophical opposites, right? One candidate doesn't believe in climate change. One candidate does believe in climate change. One candidate thinks it's a hoax. Another candidate thinks that this is our the future of our uh, economic stability is going to be based on a clean energy economy. So these are enormous, enormous shifts. But there are smaller shifts that will happen no matter who wins the presidency. I mean, we're not going to, you know, die tomorrow. The election is not going to kill us all. It might eventually, but it's not going to kill us all on that day. So what are the things that are going to happen? What do we know or pretty sure are going to happen regardless of who wins? First of all, I'm absolutely sure that things are going to slow down. Why? Because that's what happens in government or any big organization that faces change. Do you have a change in president? Even if the president is Kamala Harris and it's going to be all systems go, double down on what, um, on what we're doing, it's still going to slow down because staff changes, you know, and that's just a reality. Uh, there'll be new leadership that'll come into the different departments. I'm sure I'm not breaking any news to say that the cabinet secretaries are probably going to turn over. Um, those of you who have been in the government know what I'm talking about. If Trump wins, there's going to be a slowdown because new staff are going to come in, philosophies are going to change, directives are going to change. So you can count on that. The other thing you can really 100% count on is that there will be a major tax package coming out of the Congress. That tax package is going to be um, one that is, is highly negotiated and contentious. Why? Because the Republicans' number one um, priority is the extension of the Trump Tax Cuts and Job Act, which is a very expensive uh, set of tax cuts that expires next year. So the Republicans are going to look for a way to fund it, to extend it. And the biggest beautiful buffalo on the field will be the IRA tax credits. And so people will look to trade off. And the Democrats have their own new priorities. If Kamala Harris wins, she wants to have a low income, uh, low, low income housing tax credit and a child tax credit. And so while they, the, the Democrats may circle the wagons to protect the tax code from any interference with the energy tax credits, you can be sure that they will be in play. Absolutely sure that they're going to be in play. So these are some of the things that are, are definitely going to be on the, the uh, table in, um, in November. And one of the things, the things I want to say to you guys is, one of the places where we really need help, where we really need your thinking, is what policies are there that can help us sustain this magnificent Mount Everest of investments that we have? Because the last vulnerability I want to talk about, in, in addition to the elections, is the vulnerability of time. Because resilient policy change just takes time. It just takes time, and we might not have time. It, you, let me give you a metaphor to, that might make this clearer in, in this context. Think about Obamacare. You've all heard of Obamacare, right? Who, who hasn't heard of Obamacare? Okay, great. 
So for many years, Obamacare was, was a, a target for repeal. The Democrats lost three election cycles over Obamacare. Everybody kept trying to grab it back and claw it back, went to the Supreme Court. It was, if it wasn't for John McCain voting no on that on the Senate floor before he died, we wouldn't have Obamacare. But guess what? 12 years later, not even its biggest distractors would want to claw it back. Why? Because 50 million people have used it. It is quality care at a low cost. But in the early days, people didn't know that. It just seemed like a mess. Couldn't get in on the computers, didn't know if you qualified or not. But now that's changed. And that's where we have to get. We have to get in this energy revolution that we're in deeper roots so that they're harder to pull out. And we're not there yet. And that's where you guys come in. Because where we need to get is like your motto in your school, scale and speed. We need to understand where are the places that we can move policy faster so that we dig deeper roots and inoculate this success from being ripped out. And so I'll end with this. I have a special thing for like 12 years. I'm not sure why, but 12 years on Obamacare, this is 13 years. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen this before. I have to say I stole it from the secretary. She uses it in her presentations. But um, you can see New York City, 1900. In this picture up here on the top left, there is uh, almost all horses and one car. That circled up there, that car. 13 years later, same view, all cars, one horse. In that amount of time, we switched from picking up the poop on the ground and the horses to going to the cars. Of course, they were using Petro, but okay. <laughs> um, we're switching away from that. Uh, so it takes time and it takes you. And, uh, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Yeah. Okay. Karen, thank you very much for the opening presentation. So now we're going to have a conversation uh, with Karen. And to do that, I am very pleased to introduce my colleague, Holmes Hummel. How many of you are from EIPER? Okay, so Holmes is one of your fellow graduate from just a few years ago. <laughs> so Holmes, like Karen, also works at the intersection of government, academia, policy, and also education as well here at Stanford. So let me tell you what Holmes has done and then what Holmes is doing now. So Holmes served in the administration, in the Department of Energy, um, 2009 to 2013, and in the Office of Policy and International Affairs during the Recovery Act era. And there, some of the key focus was energy equity, a very critical topic as we contemplate how to carry out the energy transition. And between that and now, Holmes also served as the founding co-director of Clean Energy Works, a public interest organization. And then here at Stanford, Holmes is doing amazing things. As one small example, Holmes is the founding resident fellow of the Explore Energy House, which is a residence hall with more than 80 undergraduate students with a shared interest and excitement for change in energy. So I don't think there's a better individual to moderate the discussion and have the conversation with Karen. So Holmes, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I think we're going to get some lights uh, up here on the stage here momentarily. Yeah, sure. 
<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. What a privilege it is to be here with Karen Skelton now as a visiting scholar at the Precourt Institute for Energy. And you have to know that it's been an arc of public service spanning decades that brings Karen to the heights that we saw in her service in this most recent administration. So I want to open with an invitation to just take us, take us there. Karen Skelton wakes up in the morning as the most trusted and durable senior advisor to the secretary, practically from day one, and then moves on to be the secretary advisor the uh, advisor to John Podesta in the White House, the Policy Implementation Office for the Inflation Reduction Act in the Second Act. Take us there. What's it like, a day in the life of the Secretarial Senior Advisor? <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, that's a, such a silly question, really, honestly. I went to the dish this morning. That's what my life looked like this morning. I stand on so many shoulders, including yours and Kate's and Arun's and Lynn's and many other people in this room who've been doing this work for a long time. I think um, I'm just old, so I've had a lot of jobs. <laughs> you know, Some might say I've been unable to keep one for very long, but I, um, you know, I, I, my passion for this work really starts at Lake Tahoe. We all have a place that we love. That's where my soul kind of ventilates. And when I worked in the White House the first time around, um, uh, John Podesta and I, he was then the um, chief of staff, we invented the Tahoe Conference, which was a conference with, um, I have some of you heard of that before. It, it was designed in the beginning with the idea that you could balance the environment with the economy. And so you can build roads, you can, you can create businesses, you could uh, protect the land all at the same time. And that's now 26 years old. And, you know, so I have tried to follow this um, through line of, uh, cr of protecting the planet and, and saving it for our children, um, as I have also tried to, you know, work in government and serve. And, and I've gotten really lucky along the way. And politics is about luck and timing, you know. Jennifer Granholm and I were, law, you know, in law school together. Our husbands were roommates in 1984. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that ages me. And, uh, um, you know, John Podesta and I have been very good friends for a very long time. So, I mean, I, I, have, I have been super lucky and I've worked really hard and I've been um, blessed and honored to, to serve in the way I have. Well, that is a very humble response. <laughs> and I'm going to draw you out a little bit more because you are a force multiplier on a team of elite people working on these policy negotiations and implementation. And one of the things that makes you a force multiplier on the teams is that you do have an expansive intersectional view of how policy and commerce interface. Also, policy and philanthropy interface. I wonder if you can add to the prepared remarks to tell us a little bit more about your work in public-private partnerships and partnerships with philanthropy to bring everybody into the transition. Yeah. Um, well, I, I want to just be humble here because, you know, I'm here with Lynn Orr, who's been in philanthropy for many decades and decades. But when I went to the White House, um, I went at a time this last time, my second tour of duty, after the Inflation Reduction Act and the bill and the, IR and the chips were passed. And I worked with John Podesta, whose job was to get the money out the door. And I talked to him about the idea of bringing philanthropy to the table in an organized way. I, really, John Podesta has relationships in philanthropy that go back for many, many decades. So I said, let's monetize you. Let's figure out how we can bring your relationships, in, uh, and coordinate them in a way that's legal, which is not legal to direct philanthropy from government, but let's figure out a way we can work with philanthropy. So we convened a group of climate philanthropists who had been very involved in passing uh, the, the uh, energy bill of uh, 2020 and, uh, and, and many decades worth of trying to pass climate legislation, we brought them together and we said, can you think about, we challenged them to, to establish some pooled 
funds so to mingle their money and have a campaign on the outside that was informed by our priorities. So it happened. Um, we ended up being able to identify over $3 billion worth of philanthropic funding that was um, uh, invested throughout the country around specific provisions of the IRA. So for example, when um, the direct pay provisions, you know, do you, that this is a provision that allows nonprofits, churches, schools, municipalities to be eligible for cash. 30% of a project could be refunded to them in cash. Um, but they had to build the project first. So say you're a library in downtown Palo Alto and you want to put on solar panels, you're eligible for direct pay, even though you don't pay taxes, you're eligible for this money. But you have to do it first, and sometimes you can't afford it, and philanthropy can help you do that. They can upfront money to help you build a project, and then you can get paid back for it. So that's just one example. Philanthropy has made it possible to um, access communities that the legislation it is designed to reach, but are sometimes the hardest to reach. So tribal communities, uh, Justice 40 communities, EJ communities, um, uh, rural communities, and my very favorite community, I have to say, energy communities, which Kate Gordon and I worked on uh, side by side throughout the administration. We were there on, I was, I helped to stand up that, uh, that, um, interagency working group. We brought a lot of philanthropy to the table to help reach these people where they live. Um, and so that's, philanthropy has been, we could not have done we, what we have done without philanthropy. And we certainly couldn't have reached the hardest to reach communities without philanthropy. Certainly agreed. And it's an ongoing process. There's still a lot of unfinished business. Uh, and I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about what you see might be happening right now in the, in the end game of this administration. There's three months. What do you think the secretary and the chief diplomats are thinking about closing down in order to, you know, capture and, and, and secure? Yeah. And what do you think, if you venture your eyes across the horizon of the election results, what would you think are top areas for attention? for an audience as big as the one that's here or 10 times larger online, what would you be drawing attention to the unfinished business that you hope will continue to receive the benefit of support? Yeah, it's a great question. And I wanna hear your thoughts on this too, because many of you are working on issues that intersect with these bills. And I wanna know where you see time running out. It's an easy answer about what uh, Secretary Granholm is, uh, and, and John Podesta are doing right now. They're, they're in a race against the clock. They are trying to get as much funding out the door as possible. A president can claw back grants that are not fully contracted. I'm not sure how you define fully contracted, but let's just say you gotta have shovel in the ground, you know, just about. So they're very, very focused on getting grants out the door um, and in contract, not just out the door, but awarded. And um, I think that, you know, the tax credits are ha require an act of Congress. So they're a little less um, of a priority in terms of activation, but they're, not, they're, but they're definitely a priority in terms of getting guidance out around them. So how do you interpret how to use a certain tax credit? Um, I mean, they're also doing some unfinished, finishing some business like Arun, who is the chairs, the secretary's um, energy advisory board has been working on a few big projects um, for the secretary and he's completing that work so that there's a library um, and a, hit, uh, a, you know, that's codified what the thinkers in his advisory board um, we're thinking of and advising the secretary on so there's some continuity for the next administration on things like AI and other really important things. 
Um, I see Arun's looking down at his phone. He's probably like typing to his people. You guys hurry up. You have to get me this draft. <laughs> um, unfinished business. I would say there are two that stand out to me. And of course, I'd love to hear, you know, what you guys think. But permit reform is, a, I think, an absolute ne necessity uh, to get some of the big projects done that need to get done, uh, like grid modernization. Grid modernization it would be the second big a uh, piece of business that hasn't quite taken off yet because of the difficulty of permit reform and and those two intersecting um the hydrogen hubs you know i i was just told yesterday i think it was that i think there's seven hydrogen hubs four of them are under contract and three aren't so that is again one of those things that could be clawed back if it's not finished. Um, so those are some things that come to mind. Mm -hmm. For those of you that are fans of the series, you'll recognize some of the references that Karen's making. David Crane, the leader of the Office of Clean Energy Deployments, is responsible for locking in those contracts. Gave uh, remarks in this series when he was just getting started and focuses attention on the eight billion dollars for the hydrogen hubs at that time. And then in the spring, Luke Bassett from the Office for Inflation Reduction Act implementation at the Department of Treasury came and gave a seminar specifically on the tax credits and both their power and their vulnerability. The benefits that we've had through the Stanford Energy Seminar Series with thanks to John Wyant and Rachel Madison, given us deeper insight into the mechanics of what has been now the largest commitment the federal government has ever made and in the federal government's context of nation states around the world, perhaps one of the largest in world history. It's your chance to offer lines of inquiry that Karen will choose among. Since I'm the moderator, I'm going to invite multiple questions and then Karen gets to choose which ones to respond to. Got that? So we will, we will uh, take probably three or four at a time and then uh, we'll let Karen engage. And we might do that two times, three times before we run out. Who has some lines of inquiry that you have been waiting to pose to Karen Skelton, the advisor to Secretary Granholm and John Podest? I see Rem, hold on. Who else have I got? Way over there in the corner. Three, who's the fourth person? Don Fry. Robert? Ron, right. Rem. So we heard twice presidential debate yesterday was more heavy in policy than many people expected. But on energy, it was very, very light. You get a lot of information about what has been done, why <coughs> the vice president candidate on the Democratic side is not communicating that. Or is this a sign that energy maybe is not going to be as important as maybe you alluded in the beginning of your remarks? Well, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> Maybe I won't take that question. <laughs> sorry. Um, Stanford's professor John Krosnick recently published research that revealed that over 80% of all Americans, both Democratic and Republican, actually believe in the threat of climate change and believe in the green transition. Who or what do you think is holding like the government back from accelerating permit reforms, grid modernization, and sustaining investments from the IRA? And how might we address these challenges? What a thoughtfully posed question. Thank you for preparing that right here. Um, so this past summer, I interned at Diablo Canyon. So my question pertains to the future of nuclear. So with Microsoft planning to reopen Three Mile Island nuclear plant and the recent extension of Diablo Canyon um, through the DOE civil and nuclear credit program, what are your thoughts on the role of private public partnerships in revitalizing older nuclear facilities and could this signal a broader trend for nuclear in the US? Thank you, excellent. Ryan. The question is um, looking at a global perspective. So I was working on renewable microgrids in Borneo this summer. And what do you see as the role of DOE or us at Stanford in supporting the global transition? Just because, you know, there, there are a lot of objectives, as you pointed to, in a clean energy transition. And it's amazing what you all have done at the U.S. But one of the objectives being, like, addressing the global emissions, that's 
it seems to require more global lens because it's just relative DOE and standard. Yeah. You get to take your pick. Do I only get one or do I get two or? You get two, okay. six minis. Okay. okay. I'm going to do nuclear first. Um, that is so exciting that you asked that question. Um, well, just yesterday, the secretary uh, signed a $1.3 billion uh, uh, loan for the Palisades nuclear plant in Michigan. The first recommissioned, if that's the right word, uh, nuclear plant in the United States. Um, I worked on the Diablo Canyon plant reopening when I was at um, the department. The secretary believes we have to have nuclear back online in order to meet our 2050, you know, net uh, zero goals. So I think that uh, it, I would say bullish on nuclear, especially small uh, modulars. I don't, I don't know how many more big ones will come up, but definitely the small modulars, although that's going to take time. I'm going to go to you next on the, um, I mean, we have a divided government. So, it, it, you know, there's no magic wand to get things done. I think in a, in a three and a half year presidency, it was three years at the time, to be able to get as much done as we have was a miracle. And if you hear the stories, I would especially say, uh, if you're interested to talk, to go back and see the interview with Luke Bassett, who talked about the geopolitical influence on the IRA bill and how that even got done in 16 days in the summer of uh, 2022, um, we've moved with lightning speed. So uh, I just think, you know, you have a divided government and Congress is not very, uh, I, I don't know what word would I use. Uh, uh, I don't know, but it's, you know, it's contentious and it's hard to get things done. So that's what I would say. I think that's all I'll answer. That, that, that is a speaker's prerogative. <laughs> I want to take the next four. Uh, I've got one from a former colleague from Bloom, the red shirt in the back. You got a friend with you? There's two of you right there. Okay, that's two and three. Anybody else? Right down front, West Coast. Okay. Go for it, Ellen. I was impressed by the slide that you showed with the amount of money that had gone to the different districts, um, the blue and the red states. I'm curious from a political perspective, um, how or if you think that will be leveraged um, in those red districts to bring the focus kind of on the success of the climate change and energy transition? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'll have to forgive me from coming from an economics perspective, but I'd love to hear your takes on carbon pricing. What is What are the words from inside the room for a potential carbon tax? Is it the true political anathema we hear about? What are the vibes? Um, I've done quite a bit of work for the utility industry and actually spent this past summer working at DOE LPO on virtual power plants. Ah. Um, but I've learned that there's often huge misalignment of incentives between the utilities and what they need to do for grid modernization and decarbonization. Could you speak more to that misalignment and perhaps how we can get them on board? Great. Uh, my question is for the inflation and land use stability of the economy and so it's an uh, impact on the land and energy. So what is your uh, opinion? Uh, what direction about the new resident need to care about more, like it's the most important? Yeah, that might be a topic of an entire round table in February. Yeah. The directions of idea. <laughs> <laughs> Alia, I will answer this question about the um about the leveraging of the red district investments. Look, I mean, not every. Republican is opposed to the climate uh, plans. So for example, a few weeks ago, 15, 18 Republican members of the House wrote a letter to Speaker Johnson and said, please protect these investments because they're growing the economy in my districts. And so that's really positive and you would wanna see that kind of thing continue. So I think, you know, uh, I think there, there are probably uh, 
you know, a lot of Republicans who voted, every single Republican voted against the climate law. So there wasn't a single, it was unanimously opposed by Republicans. On the other hand, the Republicans do come to the ribbon cuttings. They are coming to the, they're coming to the groundbreakings. So I think that, um, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll have to speak for themselves in these districts where they're definitely having jobs grow and the economy come together. So I, I know the Democrats are going to use that uh, as, as, as sort of talking points. Um, okay. I think carbon pricing, to me, this is me speaking because I'm not in the government anymore. And so um, I'm not sure about if I can represent the vibe, but I like the word. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's something that's going to be, I, I, my, my sense is that it's time is going to be coming. Uh, I mean, I, all of this transition, living in a transition is fits and starts. Some things are going to, uh, you know, be tried and they're going to fail. Businesses are going to succeed and fail. This is going to come back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. I think carbon pricing is, has had some, you know, some, some really, as you said, it's, it suffers from a branding problem, but so did nuclear. So that's just my, I would welcome anyone to disagree with me and to have an, another point of view. And then I really honestly forget the other questions. Oh, oh, utilities. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, I would just leave it at that. I mean, their business model is so difficult. You know, we all want them to do different things. There's some great utility leaders, really, really great progressive ones. So, as Jesse Jackson used to say, let's keep hope alive. <laughs> uh, I am going to take moderator's uh, privilege for a moment and ask two quick questions. One, sure. um, as the managing director for energy equity and just transitions for the Precourt Institute for Energy, it's one of my tasks to engage the 150 affiliated faculty members on the project of incorporating energy equity principles in not just who is doing research, but even what research questions are being asked. And at the interface between technology, innovation, and policy, we see the Department of Energy and Stanford teaming up on a number of things, including recent announcements like battery innovation technology, for example, uh, battery technology innovation, I should say. So I'd like to turn to you to ask to step into the role as a champion that you have played for advancing energy equity as part of the overall enterprise of these three bills and what it means for the politics of energy transition in the United States. Yeah. Well, I feel like I want to um, bring my friend Kate Gordon up here because she really is a complete expert in this subject. And Kate, I'm going to ask you to answer this question with me. Is that okay? Welcome. Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. just going to bring the microphone to Kate Gordon. Kate was also a senior advisor to Secretary Granholm. She really specialized on, on, in, uh, in communities where equity was the issue. And she helped write and spearheaded the entire community benefits plan from the Department of Energy, which you know is now required to be answered in order to get federal money. That was Kate Gordon. And it is now a federal, federal wide. So Kate, you answer this. <laughs> Kate Gordon also has a long association with Stanford. And in another moment, I would give you a deeper introduction we're going to wrap up in about three minutes. So here you go. And no, I'll be super fast. And Karen is, uh, once again, underselling herself and her role in making these things happen. But I will say that um, one of the things the secretary really cared about when the infrastructure bill passed, and hi, everybody, um, uh, was that the projects that were happening, DOE really went from being a research and science organization to one putting steel in the ground in a big way. Big, you know, $62 billion of money in the infrastructure bill, huge projects, hydrogen hub, direct air capture. And the secretary was really, really concerned that as these huge projects were going into places, those places got real benefits from those projects. So the community benefits plan really came out of her desire to say, how are these projects interacting with these places? They're not just about the best technology or like the best, you know, how do they pencil out? It's really about what do they do for workers? What do they do for communities? So that was the genesis of the community benefits plans. And um really exciting now uh, seeing how those are getting implemented around the country has been fascinating. Yeah. 
The only thing I would add to that is that the entire Inflation Reduction Act was designed with equity in mind. So the tax credits, for example, um, there were bonus tax credits that went to, uh, to, to incentivize development in areas that you would want to see development that in poor areas, Justice 40 areas, uh, energy communities, rural, tribal. So it, it, it's, it's designed for us to think that way. I do want to use a visual aid. So friends, we're going to we're <laughs> going to close it out with a special piece. That how many people here uh, participated in energy at Stanford? And raise your hand. Yes, yes, yes. I see you. Karen Skelton Sorry. gave us a, a preview. Just the few of you who are here a couple of weeks ago uh, to something that's akin to David Letterman's top ten list, uh, and it's about federal policy and uh, making impact in Washington. I didn't want to spare you the chance to benefit from that same guidance. So we're going to close Karen Skelton Stanford Energy Seminar with these 10 I think we need to advice. Down, maybe. So these are things to think about, 10 things to know about making energy policy in Washington, D.C. Um, first of all, as we were talking about, policy can work, but policies can work, but they take time. So the policies are working because we have all this trillions of dollars of investment, but on the other hand, we don't have deep enough roots to inoculate from repeal. Federal actions require multiple hits on interdependent power barges. What that means is if you want to get something done in Washington in the federal government, you can't just go to one important person. You have to go to like, I don't know, Lynn, how many, like seven <laughs> or nine and they have to all talk to each other. So you got your work cut out for you. Three, Congress and the White House negotiate policy direction. So an idea will start like the IRA between people on the Hill and people in the White House and the policy office. And then the agencies give the detail. They actually make the policy. And then the White House, I put amplifies success, but what I meant was takes credit. <laughs> <laughs> Huh. Number four, success stands on many shoulders, including yours. And I, I said that at the beginning, but I mean, clearly, we all stand on somebody else's shoulders. And in this and in this industry, we're all on many shoulders for many decades. Um, I could go on. We can do a whole thing on number four. Uh, on five, public-private partnerships are set essential, as I talked about before, not only with philanthropy, but certainly with private sector uh, and government. Uh, six, the shorter the distance between career workers and political appointees, the longer the gain. So, you know, when I talked about things will slow down and people will change, but the, 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 the closer you can work with the career employees, they're the staying power. So this is, this is what really matters. Uh, number seven, tell the story of your impact. Like I said in the beginning, if people don't know what you're doing, then they're just going to think you're doing nothing or there won't be a reason or a justification to keep the work, the good work that you've done. So storytelling is just absolutely essential and very undervalued. Um, Number eight, except by Secretary Graham. Number eight, show up early, work hard, keep your head down. And I think that's probably the best advice here. You know, you're not gonna get anywhere. Like, I I'll just tell you very quickly, I'm sorry, I'm going, I'm going up on my time. When the first, people sometimes ask me, what's the difference between the first time you worked in the White House and the second time you worked in the White House? Um, it kind of comes down to this. The first time I worked in the White House, I was like, what meeting am I invited to? Where's my office? Do I get tickets to the thing? Do I, like, who's talking to me? Blah, blah, blah. You know, all I cared about, like, you know, how close am I to the Oval Office? Because that's where power stems from in Washington. How close are you to the Oval Office? The second time I went to Washington, and by the way, I had a really good job. I had a great office. I was on the West Wing. I had all these great things. The second time I went to Washington, I worked in a corner of an office. I don't mean like a corner office. I mean the corner of an office with four other desks in the office right outside of John Podesta's office. But I got the best work. I didn't care about anything but my work. All I cared about was getting something done. And I think that's really where the gratification comes in your in, in your work is to get something done that lasts. Um, number nine, seize opportunities. Again, what I mean by that is 
Like if you can do special things, go do them. If you if you're there and in, in, in the middle of the day, you know, you can go to a special speaker speaking or you can go and, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I have to. I just have to say, I mean, you know, like if you can get the bowling alley at the White House for your daughter's graduation party, do it. You know, do that kind of stuff because it's never going to happen again. Um, and number 10, I learned this from Leon Panetta, who was one of the uh, chiefs of staff when I was at the White House, which is like when you're there, you represent the people. This is not one party's White House or one party's Department of Energy. This is your Department of Energy. This is your White House. And if you don't feel an honor doing work on behalf of the people, then you should just quit and go home. And those are my 10 pieces of advice.